Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today's topic are monads, or actually the natural numbers, if you want at least. Um, so the natural numbers as functors. So if you ask Dr. Google what a monad is, then probably Dr. Google will tell you that a monad turns up in functional programming. And maybe if you press Dr. Google a little bit further, then Dr. Google will tell you that it's a monad that turns up category theory. So what I'm going to tell you is actually a very nice abstract concept, um, but it's actually useful in practice, in this case in uh, programming, so in computer science. I'm not going into do details um, because that's not what I'm going to do here, but some links are in the description in case you're interested. So let's have a look at monads and why I claim these are the natural numbers or at least in some sense. Of course, the natural numbers are not directly monads, but here's the point. So whenever I have a picture about counting, I realize that uh, when I looked at this picture here, uh, my counting pictures always include apples. I have no idea why, but anyway, all of you know how counting works. It's a very natural process. So you have one apple, you have two apples, you have three apples, whatever. So you count apples. Um, and yeah, of course, that's kind of the nat most natural thing in some sense you can do. And yeah, we know that humans are counting for, for a long time. So um, at the oldest, there's an old bone, which has some counting on it. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's 8,000 years old or so. It's, I think, a little bit hard to gauge. Maybe I shouldn't say, I shouldn't have said anything because I haven't double checked. Anyway, I put the link in the description. Um, but the counting numbers are certainly very natural and also some animals can count up to a certain degree, of course. Um, humans can also only count up to a certain degree. So if the numbers get too big, then usually it gets a little bit messy uh, in our heads. Also, it's just the same concept still. And for animals, it's probably just the same. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about animals and apples and whatever, but I'm going to talk about bones. I'm going to talk about the natural numbers. So here, so uh, haters are very welcome. I include zero in this case in the natural numbers. Um, yeah, it's just nicer for this video, whatever. Uh, but it forms arguably the most important set in uh, mathematics, the most important monoid set with a structure in mathematics. If you don't know what a monoid is, stay tuned on the next page. I will explain what a monoid is or recall what a monoid is. Okay, so natural numbers everywhere. Count apples, apples everywhere if you want. Uh, so what is the natural generalization. <laughs> I shouldn't use the word natural too often. What is a kind of a categorical analog of the natural numbers? And the kind of monads are not quite the correct answer. So um, maybe it would be more like a monoid objects and monoidal categories, whatever that means. But monads come relatively close and they're easier, easier to explain than monoid objects and monoidal categories. So let's have a look at what is this is all about. So here's this, one of the best illustrations I ever found on uh, Wikipedia is this table of group-like structures linked in the description where um, well, they have many group-like structures. We are interested in the monoid, this is here. And it's kind of lists a few properties. So as you can see, the main properties of a monoid are, I'm kind of ignoring this anyway, uh, associativity and identity operation. So a monoid is nothing else than a group without inverses, if you want. A monoid is nothing else than a set with a binary operation, call it times whatever, which is associative and has a unit operation. It doesn't need to be invertible. It doesn't need to be commutative. And well, whatever, in this table, there are a lot of different things. But there's something that looks exactly the same. Oh, here, uh, associativity and identity and the rest is unrequired. And indeed, that's a category. Uh, here, this adjective small just means there's some set theoretical issues going on. I'm going to ignore that. So here, a category kind of has the same requirements as a monoid. So in some sense, a category already categorifies a monoid, if you want. So we should really be able to make sense of the natural numbers in terms of categories, right? A monoid, what is a monoid? Well, a monoid is a set. Mm, we don't really like that. We want to have a category. A monoid has an operation. That's cool. We can uh, mimic that in a category. A monoid satisfies associativity and identity. That's easy to mimic in a category. Um, so we just kind of want to get rid of the point that monoids are based on sets. And, well, maybe because monoids are based on sets and monads are not based on sets. That's why they have different names. I'm not quite sure where the name monad actually comes from. 
But anyway, let's stay just uh, on topic here. So a monoid, you can phrase that categorically. And what does it mean to phrase it categorically what it is? Well, you phrase it in terms of commutative diagrams. For example, you can say that multiplication is nothing else than a map from M cross M to M. And M is, of course, my monoid here. And then associativity is just this, this commuting diagram because, well, what do you do? Well, you, this the only thing you do here is you change the order of mu. So let's say you have mu here and identity and then you mu, which is should be the same as identity on the other side, mu and identity, where I just draw, decide to draw mu as this funny graph type thing. Right, you have two inputs and you've spit out one input. So I draw it as a trivalent vertex sometimes. Anyway, so this is a way to phrase um, associativity in a commutative diagram. And there's, I'm going to ignore this a little bit, but there's also a way of to phrasing identity in a commutative diagram. And as soon as you have done that, you're basically, you're basically done. Because, well, we just interpret this commutative diagram in your favorite category and you get an analog concept. And that's what I'm going to do now. And what drops out is a monoid. Uh, sorry, a monad, not a monoid. So what is a monad? A monad is a triple. Uh, for historical reasons, monad, uh, monads are denoted by T. Not quite sure why, but I, I stick with a more historical correct notation. There is, of course, no wrong notation. But anyway, the use quotation marks, correct notation. Um, anyway, uh, off topic. Uh, so a monad is a triple of an endofunctor from C to C. This is the T and the multiplication and an identity map. And the multiplication is just a natural transformation from, well, what was it before? It was M cross M to M. So now it's T times T, so application of functors to T. And the identity, there should be a double arrow here. The identity is just uh, an operation from the identity functor to T such that, well, you just take exactly the same diagrams as before. I just copied them and replaced the uh, corresponding uh, symbols, of course. So it's really just those two diagrams. But now in terms of uh, Ts and natural transformations, that's it. So a monad is a monoid in functors because the main ingredient here is an endofunctor together with a multiplication from a uh, natural transformation from T T T to T. Um, so if you wonder where monads actually show up and why they appear uh, on this video list, the playlist here um, for those for videos here on category theory after adjunctions, because they kind of come from adjunctions and they are very closely related to adjunctions. So um, the usual idea or the usual construction, and actually every monad arises in this way, is that whenever you have an adjunction, like from vector spaces to sets, the forget free adjunction, forget and free, then doing it in the correct order gives you a monad here. So if you go this way, uh, free and then forget, then you get an endofunctor of S uh, of set, and that's your endofunctor T. And it turns out that this kind of is a shadow of the adjunction, so the monad actually a monad in this case arises from this adjunction. And it's true that um, in a certain sense, you can just need to define the appropriate categories here that every monad actually arises from an adjoint pair. So a monad in some sense is a generalization of the natural numbers, mon monoids in endofunctors, so monoids and functors. On the other hand, if you want a monad, it's a shadow of an adjunction, which kind of explains why well, this is kind of a useful concept in category theory. Anyway, so a uh, monad, well, I kind of presented you two different viewpoints. I'm mostly focused on the one with the natural numbers, kind of generalizing monoids, um, but there's also the point of view of using um, kind of as a shadow of an adjunction. Anyway, whatever you prefer as a viewpoint of a monad, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also see you next time.